Well, good morning, church. How's everyone doing today? Good, I hope. I'm going to ask you, as usual, if you wouldn't mind having the passage of the day maybe on you, on your person somehow, either on your phone or on your Bible. Uh, so if you want to flick your Bibles to Matthew uh, 13, 24 to 30, just so you can um, have the passage there to, to refer to as we work through it this morning. Now, in this passage today, we have Jesus again telling us, telling, telling the disciples, telling the crowds another parable. And so try to sort of imagine this in your mind's eye. A, Jesus would have adopted this typical teaching style of a rabbi. So imagine Jesus now not standing, but as a teacher, as a rabbi, actually sitting and the crowds gather around him. Uh, waiting expectantly to hear his wisdom. But before we get into today's parable, I think it's always good just to remind ourselves uh, what, what is a parable exactly? Um, so just bear this in mind. A parable is basically a short fictional story that tends to be written in a very uh, poetic, evocative kind of way. So a parable is more than just a description of an event. Parables are by nature, they're kind of mysterious. They contain deep truths that lie beneath the surface. Unlike other short stories, parables are designed to, to kind of draw the listener into another world and elicit a very kind of visceral response. A parable is kind of a bit like your favorite book or your favorite movie, something that really captivates you. When you listen to a parable, you're supposed to identify with certain characters. At the end of a parable, the listener is meant to feel unnerved, a little bit judged, a little bit convicted that you need to change something in your life. So parables are enigmatic. You always walk away from listening to Jesus' parables, scratching your head, confused, mulling over the story in your mind. You know, in fact, in today's parable, it opens by saying, Jesus sets before them another parable. This word for set before, in the Greek, it's paratithemai. And it was a word that was used to describe food being laid out, being set before a guest. So in other words, Jesus is saying, I want my parables to be chewed. I want them to be consumed. I want them to be digested like a good meal. I mean, I'm sure you guys know this from your Bible studies, but, you know, Jesus was obviously an expert in using language and metaphors that were relevant to his audience. And so, given the fact that he's, uh, you know, Jesus was around in a predominantly agrarian society, Jesus uses all this agricultural imagery, doesn't he? He talks about farmers and fields and grain and seeds and weeds and barns. You get the idea? You know, if Jesus had come in our time, 2017, Jesus would be ta uh, telling parables about CEOs, about corporations, about technology, about social media. But the thing about today's parable, which I'm sure you'll agree with me, is particularly striking, is this unavoidable theme of judgment. I was kind of a little bit reluctant to talk about this passage on a on a, on a, during a service that was all about VBS and children, this very striking uh, parable of judgment, but I think we can work through it anyway. So let's quickly just interpret. It's, I think it's, it's fairly clear, this parable. Let's interpret it clearly. Jesus, okay, is the farmer who sows the seed, the seed being God's good kingdom in the world. And as we saw last week, remember, you know, with the, the parable of the sower, God doesn't, dis God never discriminates where he plants. In God's love, he generously 
disperses his good seed over all types of ground, even though he knows full well many people will reject it. The slaves are the disciples, and they notice that an enemy of the field, which is Satan, has planted poisonous weeds among the good seed. And so the disciples ask Jesus, shall we destroy the weeds? But Jesus says, no, don't destroy them. Let them coexist with you. Instead, Jesus promises this future harvest time, whereby the harvesters, who later we find out are the angels, will come and separate the good seeds from the bad weeds. And Jesus says, again, very harshly it may seem, the weeds get thrown into the fire for burning, and the fruit-bearing seed will get gathered into my barn. So the word that, again, I think you guys will know this, but the word that Jesus usually uses for when he's talking about hell, the word he usually uses is Gehenna, which was, of course, referring to those rubbish dumps that were around the city of Jerusalem. But here, Jesus calls it a furnace, this place where unwanted vegetation gets incinerated. For those who consistently reject Christ's kingdom, this is their ultimate fate. I get it. I'm with you. This passage is a little bit frightening. Is it a little bit extreme? Yeah. Is it a little bit judgmental? Yes, it is. But it's here in the Bible, and you know we don't want to avoid those passages that we don't automatically get drawn to, so we have to deal with it. I think that nowadays, people tend to be a little bit allergic to any talk of judgment. We tend to be kind of relativistic, don't we, when we talk about morality. You'll hear people say today, oh, there's no real black and white, no real right and wrong. You could just do whatever feels good for you in your life. It's wrong to judge people. But here's the thing. No one really believes that judgment is bad. We have to make judgments all the time. All the decisions we make about our lives require judgment. Who to marry, what to spend your money on, what it means to be a good person. And when friends and family ask for your advice in life, they ask for your judgment and you give it to them. I think judgment is good and deep down we all, we all know that. And maybe if your life is really secure and you're provided for, you don't think about the need for an intervening judge very much. But the greatest desire for the abused and for the needy in the world is that they need a judge with real authority who will come to their aid, notice their injustice, and vindicate them. And so we raise our children, doing everything we can to instill in them a real sense of what is absolutely right to do and what is absolutely wrong to do. Don't touch the fire. Don't play with sharp objects. Don't become addicted to superficial things when you grow up. Forgive people who hurt you. Share your resources and your money and your talents with other people. We do everything we can to help our children develop a connection with God and their fellow humans and, and to cultivate good virtues as they grow up, the virtues of love and hope and faith and justice. But the problem in today's parable is that the slaves, the disciples, they want to play the role of the divine judge. But they are reminded, and so we are reminded, you never get to decide the ultimate, eternal fate of individuals. That final judgment is reserved for Christ alone. So maybe you're tempted in your life 
to uproot all the bad weeds. But Jesus says, no, no, no. Good seeds and bad weeds get to grow together. Believers and unbelievers coexist side by side until my ultimate final judgment. And isn't that another truth that we want to share with our kids today? That when they encounter other people who believe different things than they do, not to feel superior and better than them, when they encounter others who didn't grow up with the same support networks and the same opportunities to share generously what they have, when they experience hostility and resentment from their most unchristian friends, not to cast them to hell in their minds, but to work hard to convert them with love and forgiveness. Judgment must come from beyond, but in the meantime, we can embody the practices of truth-telling and reconciliation that anticipate God's future kingdom. Now, I know that it's typical for us Adventists, right, to get very caught up in talking about end times. But you'll notice in our parable today, God doesn't seem to be in a hurry to end the world. Disciples are called, rather, to live patiently before the end. So I don't know, maybe the extra time that we've been given is an opportunity to convert the weeds. And maybe Jesus would come sooner if we actually got serious about our call to evangelism. So let me stay for a moment with this theme of good and evil being allowed to coexist. And here's, here's the thought that I think this parable brings out. Suffering in the world is always an opportunity for immense good. Suffering is always an, op an opportunity for good. Think of a child's first day at school. Maybe you remember, some of you, what that was like. Being ripped away from the comfort of mum and dad, being ripped away from your house, being ripped away from everything familiar. What a traumatic experience. But a good chance, a good opportunity to develop new dependence. A good opportunity to form new relationships. A good opportunity to get an education. It's suffering, but it's a chance for good. Or at the other end of the spectrum, think of the extreme poverty, disease, and death that plagues a country like India, for example. Yet that evil became the opportunity for St. Teresa of Calcutta to form a sisterhood of 4,500 people active in 133 countries, giving herself wholeheartedly to the poorest of the poor, living a life of total sacrificial love. You now the phrase goes, without the cruelty of the tyrant, there is no virtue of the martyr. Now does the good that can come out of the suffering, does that justify the evil and the suffering. No, of course not. Nevertheless, in the midst of evil, there is always a chance for God's people to gather together and to shine more brightly. Living in a world where good and evil coincide, if our faith is deeply rooted enough, if we spend time cultivating it in prayer, in worship, in this community, in self-sacrifice, we will bear good fruit. And I don't think that there's any message more timely for our children today. So I want to close with another short parable, actually the parable that immediately comes after the one we read today. 
says Jesus proposed another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a person took and sowed in a field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when full grown, it is the largest of plants. It becomes a large bush and the birds of the sky come and dwell in its branches. You see where I'm going with this? Our hope and our prayer is that all of our children would be like that mustard seed. Though they may seem small and insignificant now, they would grow to be the largest of all the plants. And isn't that, isn't that really the message for all of us? So, friends, may you stay close to Jesus Christ. May you be good and do good in the world. May you live generous and compassionate lives. And may the love that you radiate draw people to you and to your God. Amen. Let's respond to these words of Jesus together now by, by standing and with joy and enthusiasm and passion singing our last hymn together, It Is Well. Please stand and sing with me, It Is Well, hymn number 530. <laughs>